Trump administration recently suggested that they'll be taking a look at possibly breaking up the big banks or to reintroduce tough new regulations like the Depression Era Glass-Steagall Act. Now, regardless of what you think of the Trump administration, I won't be holding my breath on a big bank breakup or tough new regulations. Breaking up the big mega banks or introducing tough new regulations reminiscent of the 1933 Glass-Steagall Act is an idea worth exploring. Unlike most people, I view banks as essential to a successful modern economy, or in other words, I don't believe banks are the creation of the Antichrist. However, what I like about banks are the boring aspects of banking, taking deposits, making business loans and mortgages, check and payment processing, online banking, and debit and credit cards. Banks play an essential function in the economy by facilitating the transfer of passive idle savings to productive business loans, such as small business loans for opening a restaurant or a retail outlet. These business loans generate jobs and allow for the production of goods and services. Banks also provide home mortgages that allow for widespread home ownership. Can you imagine saving up the entire cost of a house or an apartment before you're able to purchase it? Many people have trouble coming up with a 10 to 25% down payment for a home let alone the entire cost of a dwelling. Now, those boring aspects of banking that I view as essential and a net gain for the economy is known as commercial banking. And most people are familiar with the financial services and products offered by commercial banking from the local bank's branch. What I don't enjoy about modern banking is the intertwining of commercial banking with the more speculative and volatile business of investment banking. Investment banking is what most people imagine Wall Street to be like helping large companies issue stocks and bonds, running hedge funds, and taking speculative position in equities, bonds, derivatives, and any other financial assets that they can get their hands on. And to be fair, investment banking is not all bad. Allowing companies to tap into capital markets and issue stocks and bonds helps companies grow quickly, which results in job creation and economies of scale. But the intertwining of commercial boring banking and investment banking has made banking on a whole riskier, fraught with conflict of interest and adding systemic risk to the economy. These megabanks have become too big to fail and in essence taking the economy as hostage since it also controls the boring parts of banking which include banking services that everyday people depend on while engaging in speculative risky behavior. It's the corporate structure of investment banks that encourage risk-taking for its employees. If they make a bet and it goes right, then they get large bonuses. But if they're wrong, taxpayers will pick up the bill. Or taking positions today that might damage the company and the economy in the long term. But by then, the original position taker might have already left the firm, or at the very least, they've already received their bonuses. As Nobel economist Joseph Stiglitz puts it, Trust in the power of economic incentives to bend human behavior towards self-interest, towards short-term self-interest. And it isn't just in the light of the recent 2008 financial crisis that we've stumbled onto this discovery that the intermingling of commercial banks with investment banks might be a bad idea. In the aftermath of the Great Depression, many saw the intermingling of boring commercial banks with investment banks as a danger to the economy. Problems originating on Wall Street, damaging the financial well-being of everyday depositors. As a result, Senator Carter Glass of Virginia and Representative Henry Stiegel of Alabama proposed a new bill that separated boring everyday commercial banking from the more speculative and risky investment banking. As you might have guessed, the bill is commonly known as the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act was endlessly debated, discussed, and refined by Congress, economists, bankers, and lobbyists, and even President Roosevelt, who threatened to veto the entire bill because the bill also called for the creation of the Federal Depositors Insurance Corporation. But finally, in 1933, President Roosevelt signed the act into law. But with time, the banking industry tripped away at the oversights provided by the Glass-Steagall Act. The banking industry is relentless and persistent, if nothing else. The banking industry argued that the Glass-Steagall Act was too restrictive and put American banks at a disadvantage when competing internationally, since big banks in other countries didn't have to abide by the Glass-Steagall Act. In 1999, the banking industry got their wish, and the Glass-Steagall Act was effectively repealed with the Congress passed and Bill Clinton signed graham leak Bleely Act. Now, to be fair, some of the participants of the 2008 financial crisis weren't traditional banks. Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns were investment banks, AIG was an insurance company, and Freddie and Fannie Mae were quasi-government enterprises, so repealing or not repealing of the Glass-Steagall Act wouldn't have affected these prime causes of the 2008 financial crisis. 
But the removal of Glass-Steagall did result in the creation of the too-big-to-fail banks, such as Chase Manhattan's merger with J.P. Morgan in 2000, creating a bank that at the time held assets of over $660 billion. Today, J.P. Morgan Chase has assets of over $2 trillion. More subtly and insidiously, the intertwining of boring commercial banking and investment banking resulted in a banking culture that was more willing to take risks, to generate high returns, to be awarded the big bonuses. Commercial banking following Glass-Steagall was regarded as boring and meant for the least ambitious business school graduates. Going back to Nobel-winning economist Joseph Stiglitz, the most important consequence of the repeal of Glass-Steagall was indirect. It laid in the way repeal changed an entire culture. Commercial banks are not supposed to be high-risk ventures. They're supposed to manage other people's money very conservatively. When repeal of Glass-Steagall brought investment banks and commercial banks together, the investment bank culture came out on top. There was a demand for the kind of high returns that could be obtained only through high leverage and big risk-taking. I, for one, welcome the return of the boring banker. Thanks for watching. Please consider subscribing to the Strange World of Econ channel. It's a great free way to support the channel so that I can bring you more videos from the Strange World of Econ. Till next time.